I've always said that one of my favorite parts of fighting game crossovers is seeing characters from outside of the genre adapted to fit the mode of a fighting game. This ranges from characters like Mega Man and Strider in the Versus series, Ryu Hayabusa in Dead or Alive, the truckload of Final Fight characters in Street Fighter, and so on and so forth. One trend that exemplifies this for me is that of the guest character. They've existed in the genre for years. Karna from the platformer of the same name in Fighters history, and Art of Fighting's Ryo showing up in Fatal Fury Special being the two earliest examples I can think of. These are especially fun, because they can involve characters from outside the gaming medium itself, like NetherRealm Studios' long history of cross-media guest fighters, or Tekken 7 swerving everyone with Negan. This was originally going to be a video talking about some of them, spurred by the reveal of 2B as a guest character in Grand Blue Rising, joining the ranks of folks like Kratos who have somehow been guests in two separate fighting game series. But the more I worked on that script, the more I realized I don't have much to discuss on that topic that'd be especially interesting. Sure, it'd be neat to break down the movesets and see what's derived from their source material, but I couldn't help but feel like I'd be treading well-traveled ground. So I trashed the work I'd done on that video and went about my usual business. When I'm not at my day job, hanging out with friends or family, or working on videos, I'm usually playing something, and one series I've been chipping away at is a crossover strategy RPG trilogy developed by Monolith Soft and published by Namco, the Cross series. This is a set of games beginning with the Japan-only release Namco Cross Capcom on the PlayStation 2. This game mashes the universes of Capcom and Namco together to unite against an evil organization posing a multiversal threat. Characters both well-known and obscure pop up in these games, and while they're pretty shallow and repetitive gameplay-wise, and I cannot stress that last part enough, they're an absolute treasure trove of gold for sickos like me. Now to play anything, if they have cool fan service interactions, you can't really get anywhere else. Being that Capcom and Namco have multiple fighting game series under their belts, naturally, some of the characters that appear are from games like Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, Tekken, and Soul Calibur. The series continued on the 3DS as Project for a Zone and added another company with fighting game history to the mix, Sega. Nintendo characters also show up in Cora Zone too, but that's neither here nor there. So now you have neat stuff like fighting Viper's characters, interacting with Rival School's characters, as well as evil organizations like J6 from Virtua Fighter being on the radar of Street Fighter Shadowloo. It's neat. While they're strategy RPGs, the games themselves do have some fighting game inspiration, with encounters taking place on a separate screen that allow you to put in simple inputs to juggle your opponent for as long as you have available attacks. There's an additional element where you can get bonus damage if you time your attacks to the exact frame the enemy touches the ground after a juggle, so fighting game players that have an eye out for that kind of thing actually have something of a leg up here. And it was while I was winding down one night playing Project Cora Zone that I had a thought. Instead of talking about guest characters in fighting games, what about fighting game characters showing up in non-fighting games? So I started jotting down a list of the ones I knew of off the top of my head, did a good chunk of research, and found that it's something that doesn't happen as often as one would probably like, but more than you'd think. Now this isn't going to be an overview of literally every example out there. I'm limited by what games I could reasonably obtain, but I'll try to touch on all of the notable ones. Before we get started in earnest though, some ground rules. 1. Characters that count in this have to have been created for and usable in a fighting game before their guest appearance. For example, Ryu showing up in Namco Cross Capcom and the Cross games count because he was created for a fighting game first and foremost. Someone like Guy from Final Fight wouldn't count because he was created for a beat-em-up before crossing over in the fighting games, and despite both genres sharing some DNA, there are still two separate genres at the end of the day. 2. Spin-offs or even mainline games for fighting game IP that inexplicably change genres are A-OK, -okay, as long as they primarily feature characters that debuted in fighting games. So something like, say, Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks would qualify, because even though it's an alternate retelling of a fighting game being Mortal Kombat 2, the game itself is a beat-em-up. 3. The characters don't have to necessarily be playable in said guest appearance, but they have to be more than a several second cameo. Some of the characters we'll be talking about serve as a supporting character, or even a boss in the games they're in, and that counts. 
But if it's something small like the Street Fighter cameos in Final Fight 2, then yeah, I'm not counting them. 4. And this is more for logistical reasons than any kind of disdain for them, I'm not including mobile phone games in this. There's no shortage of gacha games with crossover characters in them, and that could honestly take up an entire video on its own. But to keep things organized, as well as my sanity intact, we're going to skip those. That said, let's get started. Since I've brought up the Core series already, I may as well go into detail there. So, characters from Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, Rival Schools, Cyberbots, Star Gladiator, Tekken, Soul Calibur, Virtua Fighter, and Fighting Vipers all appear in this series, and it's really fun to see them interact. What's neat is that this series, despite being a crossover series with no actual barrel in the overarching plots of any of the games involved, outside of maybe the Endless Frontier characters, they still kind of take an everything as canon approach to character interactions. So characters like Bon and Akira are already familiar with each other in Project Cross Zone because they recognize each other from Fighters Megamix. All three games, while largely standalone, all take place after one another, so sometimes characters in one game will reference a past crossover entry. Taki, for example, was one of the Soul Calibur characters featured in Namco Cross Capcom, but in Project Cross Zone 2 we get Natsu from Soul Calibur 5. When Natsu shows up, she's confused about what's going on, but after introducing herself, Hiryu mentions that he met a ninja from her time period using the same fighting style some time ago, alluding to he and Taki crossing paths in Namco Cross Capcom. Jin and Ryu recognize each other in Cross Zone 1 since the two of them met in Namco Cross Capcom. When Heihachi shows up in the same game, he's one of the first people to connect the dots that Cross Zone 1's events are somehow related to Namco Cross Capcom. But even cooler to me is how they'll connect characters from series from separate companies. Pi, for example, is acutely aware of the ongoings of the Street Fighter universe, thanks to a fellow movie star friend of hers. The character is never named, but it's implied to be Fei Long, who, like Pi, is also an action film star from Hong Kong, so it makes sense that they'd have similar social circles. Ken knows of the Judgment 6 conglomerate from Virtua Fighter due to being owner of a giant corporation himself. The Mishima Zaibatsu is infamous enough that even Akira has heard of them and connects the dots when he first meets Jin. It's a really clever way of tying two otherwise worlds apart series together. One of the coolest things that happens in these games is in regards to Star Gladiator's representation in Project Corazon 2. The main hero representative for that series there isn't Hayato like you'd expect, but instead, June. The antagonist they use from the games, though, is Black Hayato. His running plotline through Project Cross Zone 2 actually picks up a plotline from Plasma Sword that was pretty much never going to be touched again because that series is never coming back. In Plasma Sword, we learn that Black Hayato is an alternate personality implanted in Hayato via a microchip by series antagonist Bill Stein during the first game's final boss fight. In Black Hayato's ending, he actually manages to become the dominant personality, locking the real Hayato away in his mind, though I think that's just a what-if ending. In Project Cross Zone 2, he shows up before June explains that he came into contact with some of the artificially intelligent data anomalies from the Dot .hack series while tracking down a criminal, and that reactivated the Black Hayato personality. Over the course of the game, he shows up as a boss, constantly fighting for control over his body, though the real Hayato was finally able to gain control by the end of the game. Another fun bit involves Heihachi in Project Cross Zone 2. Kamurocho, the fictional district from the Yakuza series, has been overrun by zombies and other BLWs, mirroring the events of the non-canon Yakuza entry Dead Souls, and the general public assumes it's some Mishima Zaibatsu bullshit, and Heihachi ends up hiring an attorney to legally defend him. That attorney ends up being… Phoenix Wright. Now, him fighting in Marvel vs. Capcom is one thing, since there's a pretty healthy suspension of disbelief for that series in general, but an RPG series would be way above his pay grade, right? Well, after Phoenix and Maya get wrapped up in this whole mess, Morgan actually takes Maya's Magatama and charges it with a bunch of spiritual energy, allowing the both of them to actually keep up in fights. Darkstalker's characters are actually pretty well utilized in these games, as the Makai, the demonic realm most of the characters in the series are either from or at least tangentially associated with, usually ends up being something of a nexus point for the more demonic characters from each game company. As an aside, an assassin gets hired to kill Phoenix since he's Heihachi's attorney, 
and that assassin ends up being none other than Baby Bonnie Hood. We'll talk more about her in a bit. The Virtua Fighter characters get involved with things since Dorao, a product of J6, ends up being co-opted by SIN from Street Fighter 4 and then eventually Shadaloo itself. Bond from Fighting Vipers gets involved while waiting on a kid from another high school he was going to fight to settle some long-standing school-related scores. That other high schooler turns out to be Batsu from Rival Schools, who didn't show up because he was inexplicably sucked into a dimensional portal on his way to meet Bond. It's really cool how they find ways to tie all of these characters together. Is it a bit fanfiction-ish? Sure, but that's the entire point and I love it for that. The games also have a training mode for you to perfect those juggle combos, and in Core Zone 2, the backdrop is quite literally Street Fighter 4's training stage. It even has Mokujin as the training dummy. There's some neat, ultra-specific fighting game shoutouts and some of the cinematic special attacks as well. For example, in Ryu and Ken's special attack in the first game, look closely at Ryu after he does the EX Tatsu. <laughs> Yeah, he focus attack dash cancels the Shoryuken into Metsu Hadouken, one of the most reliable ways players combo into that ultra in Street Fighter 4. I know I said I'd be focusing on solely the fighting game characters in this video, but I do want to highlight Zero's special attack with X in the second game. He pops Sogenmu and then proceeds to repeatedly use Raikosen on the opponent. Yeah, he's quite literally doing lightning loops from Marvel 3. The references get even more esoteric though. There's a neat blink and you'll miss it bit in a Kira and Pai special attack in the first game. <laughs> Did you spot it? I'll show it again. <laughs> Now, to the untrained eye, this attack here doesn't really stand out. Virtua Fighter fans, and specifically Akira mains, might see this frame and start sweating though. This quick knee is the Teishitsu Dantai, one of the most difficult attacks in fighting game history to consistently pull off, and at least part of the reason why Akira is generally considered to be one of the hardest ever fighting game characters to learn and play at a high level. It's done in Virtua Fighter by pressing guard and kick at the same time, but the catch is that you have to let go of guard within one frame of doing the initial input, which is why you'll commonly see the move referred to as his just frame knee in Virtua Fighter circles. Your reward for doing it properly though, is a valuable whiff punish tool and one of the fastest, most versatile launchers in Virtua Fighter. So if you do plan on picking up Akira, it's probably worth at least attempting to learn it. If I had a nickel for every crossover strategy RPG series Darkstalkers characters have appeared in, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Despite the similar sounding name, Cross Edge is actually a strategy RPG from Idea Factory, who you may know as the Hybrid Dimension Neptunia folks. The idea is basically, what if we took a bunch of niche series from NIS, Gust, and Idea Factory and made one big, kinda mid RPG with them? Oh, and Darkstalkers too, I guess. Of all the crossovers on this list, this is the one that strikes me as the most random, not so much for the RPG series represented, but for Darkstalkers in particular being here. I'm going to assume someone high up at Combiner Heart must have been a really big fan of the series or has friends at Capcom or something, I don't know. The game itself is actually kind of bad. Not repetitive, but still charming like Project for a Zone, but more, oh, this is why a mint condition copy of this only ran me 15 bucks kind of bad. Idea Factory RPGs and their, um, quality isn't something I'm really equipped to go in depth on in this video, but of the very few I've played, none of them were what I'd call good. The most notable thing about this game, as far as the Darkstalkers characters are concerned, is that I'm pretty sure this is actually the first instance of English voice acting for any of the characters from the series, at least outside of animation. So there's that I guess. Not bad, but you lost it at the end. You always leave your back exposed like that. So what, are we supposed to thank you for coming to our rescue or something? Don't 
be rude. Pay attention. The fight's not over yet. Need some help, sweetie? Whatever. It's not like you'd go away if I said no, right? <laughs> smart boy. I'm glad. I do so love smart boys. Cannon Spike is a game from that late 90s, early 2000s era where it felt like there was a new Capcom game coming out every other week, and I say that lovingly. This one's not actually developed by Capcom though. It's a Psycho joint, who you may know if you're in the shooters as a developer of games like Gunbird and Strikers 1945. It's immediately apparent when looking at the game too. It's an overhead shooter in the vein of something like Capcom's old Commando game or SNK Shot Troopers. It's called Gunspike in Japan, but it got the more distinct and honestly pretty fitting title of Cannon Spike internationally, since Cammy's in the game and all. While the primary method of attack in the game is shooting, you can execute special moves, some of which are melee attacks, and fittingly, Cammy's is the titular Cannon Spike. Charlie's also playable in the game as well, which makes sense given his military background. He gets Sonic Break and Somersault Kick as special moves in this as well. There's other Capcom characters in the game that aren't strictly fighting game characters, like Mega Man as a secret character, and Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins reimagined as a badass in a mech suit of armor. The one most relevant to this video subject, and once again, a Darkstalkers character popping up in everything that isn't a new Darkstalkers game, is BB Hood from Vampire Savior. Characters in Cannon Spike all have some sort of wheel transportation device to facilitate movement in the game, and hers is a scooter, which feels hilariously in character. Her standard projectile is her firing off her trademark machine guns. Her heavy projectile is Cheer and Fire from Vampire Savior. Her standard melee attack is her standing medium from Vampire Savior. And her heavy attack is her Apple for You super from that game as well. She honestly kind of fits this game like a glove, and I'm just happy to see a Darkstalkers cameo that doesn't involve Morrigan for once. Morrigan's great, but so is the entire Darkstalkers cast, and it'd be nice for people outside of the usual suspects to get some shine. I can't move on without talking about one of this game's bosses, Fallen Balrog. Claw, not Boxer, by the way. So for whatever reason, Vega is just flat out not having a good time in this game. Kimmy and Charlie got ever so slight redesigns for this game, but Vega looks like he heard Marilyn Mantle on Spotify for the first time and hasn't been the same since. It's a pretty bold redesign though, I'll give it that. It goes without saying that this game is definitely non-canon, but Capcom did acknowledge its existence in Street Fighter V with canon spike costumes for Kimmy and Charlie, along with special win quotes if they happen to fight each other with them. You'd think this would be the only time Kami would randomly show up outside the context of a fighting game, but nope. Final Fight Streetwise is… well, yeah. I'll be honest, it's actually not the worst thing I've ever played, but it's very much a mid-2000s GTA Me Too game through the lens of a 3D brawler. Now I'm not here to talk about the Final Fight characters, since as I mentioned earlier, they originate from beat-em-ups, despite their numerous fighting game appearances. However, there is a fighting game character that actually shows up as a boss, Kami. Not sure what her reason for being here is, but maybe she's deep undercover when it's out to Red Mission or something. She uses attacks like Spiral Arrow and has a somewhat grittier looking design, though she's still not wearing pants because I'm assuming she had an allergy to them before Street Fighter 6. If this game was going to have some kind of Street Fighter representation, I think this was actually the best way to go about it. It's a surprisingly well-considered decision in a game made up of multiple baffling decisions. Speaking of baffling decisions, Death by Degrees is a really, really interesting game, and I can't decide if it's for the right or wrong reasons. On paper, a brawler spinoff starring Nina getting into some assassin shit is a really cool idea. Outside of like, I don't know, Tekken Ball Tournament Edition, or a completely bonkers Yoshimitsu character action game, this is something I could have seen myself asking for. It kind of feels like the idea behind Tekken Force stretched into an entire game, and that's neat. 
However, the concept is bogged down by some of the most baffling design decisions I've ever seen in an action game. The combat is primarily executed through the right analog stick. You flick it in a direction to execute attacks, and doing it multiple times results in extended attack strings. It's kind of jank, but kind of novel. Once you figure it out, it's really easy to curb stomp everything, but I kind of miss when games weren't afraid to swing for the fences with experimental combat systems like this. Unfortunately, any kind of novelty I find in the controls are ruined pretty thoroughly by the game's camera. Think Ninja Gaiden's camera, but the cameraman is drunk, underpaid, and kind of spiteful. You can recenter the camera with one of the shoulder buttons, but <laughs> good luck doing that successfully while trying to navigate during a fight. Once you beat the game, you can actually carry Nina's stats over into a new playthrough, and even neater, you also unlock Anna as a playable character in her own separate mode. If you beat Anna's side mode and then play through the main game up to what's normally the final boss fight against her, you have the option to actually fight Heihachi, which is pretty cool, even for this game. The game is objectively not great, but I do legitimately think it's an interesting game idea undermined by, well, the game itself. There's also an unlockable costume that changes Nina's character model to the one she had in Tekken 2, which is really cool. I'm a big fan of when games have retro low poly skins like this. While we're talking about Namco stuff, there's one last game I want to bring up here, and I like the questionable qualities of Death by Degrees, this one's legitimately kind of great. Urban Rain is a 3D beat em up that feels like a mix between the Def Jam series and Sega's Spike Out, with some Tekken DNA thrown in the mix. You play as Brad Hawk, who has to fight his way through a seedy criminal underworld to track down a missing man. The enemy AI is pretty aggressive, and that's kind of a bummer, but at the same time it feels really satisfying when you're able to pull off some sick maneuvers. You can juggle opponents in this game very similarly to Tekken, denoted by it having similar hitspark animations to the PS2 era Tekken games. Because no brawler is complete without it, there's also a versus mode that can be played up to 4 players that kind of works like an arena fighter, but leaves the mechanics from the main game relatively unchanged. Two of the characters you can unlock for this mode are Paul Phoenix and Martial Law. Considering Namco could have easily stuck an Mishima or even one of the Williams sisters in and called it a day, I appreciate that they didn't go for the wholly obvious character picks here. And since the combat system is already pretty Tekken coded, they get some sauce in this as well. In all honesty, while the game isn't incredibly spectacular, this is a game I'd actually recommend tracking down a copy of. It's a surprisingly good time and isn't really expensive to boot. Okay, so we all know Mortal Kombat, Sub-Zero Mythologies, and Special Forces suck, right? Cool. In all seriousness though, these are not good games, and there's literally dozens of videos and articles and reviews out there telling you why, so I won't really talk about it here. One thing I do kind of find neat though is that Mortal Kombat, at least up to MK11, still considered mythology's canon, with some explicit references made to the game by characters like Fujin. One Mortal Kombat spin-off that is worth talking about though is Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. I'm gonna say something that might be a bit controversial. This is actually my favorite Mortal Kombat game. Sure, a part of that comes from really, really loving beat-em-ups, but the other part comes down to it just being a really well-executed vision. Shaolin Monks is a co-op 3D beat-em-up that takes place during the events of Mortal Kombat 2, and reimagines the stages from that game as big brawler levels, and it's all tied together with some surprisingly fun combat. You've got hazards, stage fatalities, boss fights against Mortal Kombat characters, it's all really great. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but the Genesis port of Mortal Kombat 2 is actually the first fighting game I ever played, so it's one of the games in the series I have the largest attachment to, and seeing places like the Living Forest reimagined through the lens of a brawler level puts a dumbass grin on my face every time. I'm also a big fan of how they took hidden characters from the OG trilogy, and implemented them as secret optional bosses that you have to go out of your way to find. More games need secret optional bosses. But let's say you want to see Mortal Kombat characters in an even wackier setting. NBA Jam is to this day one of the greatest arcade sports games of all time. Be it the original Midway entries or the surprisingly fantastic EA revival, NBA Jam is the kind of fast-paced, over-the-top game that even non-sports fans can enjoy. 
If there's one thing aside from its tone that the first game in its update NBA Jam Tournament Edition was known for, it was its roster of completely bonkers secret characters. From including then Midway staff like Mortal Kombat's own John Tobias, Eugene Jarvis, best known for arcade hits like Defender, Robotron 2084, and the Cruisin' series, to the console ports having celebrities and notable folks like Bill and Hillary Clinton, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, and even Heavy D. The initial arcade release of NBA Jam Tournament Edition had four secret characters if you wanted to get nasty though. Reptile, Sub-Zero, Scorpion, and Raiden are all playable in the first two arcade revisions of Tournament Edition, done by inputting a specific set of initials and birthdays when the game asks if you'd like to enter information for record keeping before a game. When you do it right, you can even hear the Mortal Kombat announcer say the name of the character you enabled. Reptile. There's something pretty great about seeing Karl Malone pass the ball over to Scorpion before going in for a dunk. Imagine if, instead of killing Sub-Zero in the first Mortal Kombat tournament, he and Scorpion played ball and Sub got his ankles broken on the court instead. Probably would have brought even greater shame to the Lin Kuei, honestly. There's another code that can be done as well, and entering it correctly gives you the message Fatalities Enabled. No, you can't actually kill anyone, but if you shove an opposing team player while on fire, it actually sets them on fire, which is pretty hilarious. Sadly, the Mortal Kombat characters were removed from the arcade versions and completely omitted from the console ports at the request of the NBA. They apparently didn't want to be associated with that kind of violence, and Mortal Kombat itself was a really hot button topic at the time to begin with, the ASRB having been formed the very same year as a result of Mortal Kombat. So sure, I guess. Remember when there were American football games out there that weren't Madden? NFL Fever, Backyard Football, Quarterback Club, hell, I'm not even that much of a sports game guy, and even I know NFL 2K5 is still the gold standard for football games. NFL Blitz was one such series, and it was pretty much the NFL equivalent to NBA Jam, being a fast-paced arcadey football game more focused on fun than realism. While the NBA objected to the use of Mortal Kombat characters, the NFL apparently didn't care, as there's two characters that show up in the first NFL Blitz. I'm going to assume Raiden consulted with the Elder Gods and they advised a career in the NFL, since he shows up in this game as well as NBA Jam. Joining him is Mortal Kombat 4 Big Bad Shinnok. Maybe the league promised him his amulet if he wins the Super Bowl. Virtua Fighter is a series that doesn't do crossovers anywhere near as often as any other franchise on this list, and outside of the aforementioned Project Cross Zone, when it does happen, it's usually with other fighting games, like Fighters Megamix, Dead or Alive 5, and Zengeki Bunko Fighting Climax. All games I'll probably talk about whenever I get around to Akira's Sega Legacy video. There is one out of the norm crossover the series has been involved with though, Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. This is a kart racer developed by Sumo Digital. Sumo Digital have had their hands in quite a few games in the last decade or so, but in the mid to late 2000s, they were best known as the studio that developed OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast, a home port of OutRun 2 SP with a ton of new content. Not really all that related to the video, but play OutRun 2006 y'all, it's a good game. They'd later go on to do other games for Sega, like Sega Superstars Tennis, which eventually led to All-Stars Racing. Its sequel, All-Stars Racing Transformed, is still to this day considered one of the best kart racers of all time, up there with Crash Team Racing and Mario Kart 8. Virtua Fighter gets some love by including Jackie Bryant and Akira as racers in the game. Jackie does the driving, while Akira hangs out on the passenger side. Both characters are using their Virtua Fighter 5 designs as well. I actually really love this roster pick, because for what little lore Virtua Fighter has, and that's not a lot, one thing that is firmly established is Jackie being a race car driver when he's not fighting, so he makes a natural fit for a racing game. The sports car he's driving is called Red Lightning, and it looks like a legally distinct Ferrari, almost definitely meant to be a nod to OutRun, especially given the developer. Things get even cooler though. An item you can get in All-Stars Racing is the eponymous All-Star. This only appears if you're not doing too great in the race and involves the characters doing something special to give them a boost that'll hopefully get them back in the running. For Jackie and Akira's All-Star move, 
Akira hops out of the car and then hits it with a Tetsuzanko, sending it fucking flying through any other cars unfortunate to be ahead of them. It's a really cool way to implement Akira's most iconic move into the game, and a bit of Akira's Virtua Fighter 5 theme even plays during this to boot. Guilty Gear is a series that, if nothing else, swings for the fences. It was doing high-res, super detailed sprite art for its games in an era where 2D fighting games were considered all but dead, had a distinct heavy metal aesthetic that bled out into every aspect of its visual design, and of course, it had instant kills. It's a series that also isn't afraid to experiment. Guilty Gear Judgment on the PSP is one such example. Judgment is actually a compilation release. It contains a port of Sharp Reload, which honestly was pretty bonkers to have when it handheld in 2006, and the Tatilier Guilty Gear Judgment. Judgment is a spin off of the series, using a lot of Guilty Gear X's assets, but using it for a beat em up instead. I don't know if the game is canon or not. My understanding is that it has no bearing on the main Guilty Gear plot, but also doesn't have anything that necessarily contradicts it either. If any Guilty Gear fans more well versed in the lore are watching this, please feel free to fact check me in the comments. The series' usual control scheme of punch, kick, slash, and heavy slash have been replaced with a light, medium, and heavy attack, along with a jump button. However, you still put in the special motions for your respective characters to do their special moves, like quarter circle forward for Saul's gun flame or Kai's stun dipper. The enemy variety isn't anything to write home about. And for the first few levels, you'll almost exclusively be fighting these lizard looking things in various colors. The bosses are pretty inspired though. Thankfully, the game isn't too long, but there's a decent amount of replay value in it thanks to all of the unlockable characters. It's not a bad way to waste an afternoon or two. Now, we've talked about spin offs, but what about an entire mainline game that switches genres completely? Enter Guilty Gear 2 Overture. Instead of being a fighting game, this one's a weird action game in real-time strategy hybrid, with Guilty Gear series lead Daisuke Ishiwatari stating that he felt that the team had did everything they set out to do with a fighting game with the Guilty Gear X games. While the game does take place after the events of Axon Core Plus, the game's plot is largely meant to follow up from the event of the first Guilty Gear game, hence the title, Guilty Gear 2. You'd think a game like this would be kind of pushed to the side and forgotten about once the series went back to fighting games with XR, but no. This game is canon as fuck. A lot of characters, concepts, and plot beats in XR and specifically Sign have their origins in Overture. Sin debuted in Overture. Dr. Paradigm? Overture. The first time we get a playable physical confrontation between Saul and that man? Overture. The existence and basic concept of the backyard? Overture. The first instance of a valentine? Yup. Overture. Aside from the game itself being a huge departure, it was also exclusive to the Xbox 360 for a pretty long time, stifling the reach of an already ultra niche game. It did get a PC port a few years back, and I swear it feels like the game has been eternally on sale for the last three years. You can get it for practically pennies these days if you have a PC or a Steam Deck, so I'd say it's worth the curiosity. When I started this list, I initially expected that the characters and series that appeared in the most non-fighting game stuff was probably going to be Darkstalkers related, and for good reason. There's far more Darkstalkers crossovers than there are Darkstalkers games at this point. So imagine my surprise when I realized there's another fighting game series and specifically a character that's had nearly as many cross-genre crossover appearances. When the Ninja Gaiden series was resurrected in 2004, they took a page from Capcom's playbook and decided to fold Ryu Hayabusa's appearances in the Dead or Alive games into the greater Ninja Gaiden canon. However, Ryu was in action platformers before he was ever in TOA, so this ain't about him. This is about Ayane. So, Ayane first shows up in the 2004 Ninja Gaiden game as a supporting character, assisting Ryu in feeding him information over the course of the game. In Ninja Gaiden 2 Sigma, the updated re-release of the second game, Ayane becomes playable and even gets her own story chapter. She's also playable in the game's tag mission mode as well. 
Ayane doesn't hit as hard as Ryu, but is a lot more nimble instead, making it easier for her to dance around groups of enemies without being touched. She shows up again in Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge as a playable character with some exclusive story chapters, but she can also be played in any mission in the game through the game's mission replay functionality. Things don't end with Ninja Gaiden though. She also shows up in many of Koei Tecmo's Warriors games, starting as an NPC in Dynasty Warriors Strike Force, who will gift you her weapon if you fulfill her requests. She shows up as a playable character in the Japan exclusive Samurai Warriors Versus for the 3DS. Warriors Orochi 3 is her first major playable appearance in these games, alongside some other characters I'll get to in a second. In this game, she appears to be pulled in the thing sometime after the event of Dead or Alive 4. She'd go in to appear in subsequent games like Warriors All-Stars. She also appears in multiple games in the Senran Kagura series as well, alongside a few other Dead or Alive characters. Ayane stars in unlockable bonus chapters in the most recent Fatal Frame game, Maiden of Black Water. She's tasked with tracking down a young girl who's gone missing. Since she doesn't have a camera, she instead has special tattoos that allow her to stay safe from ghosts, making this more of a stealth mission instead. It's worth mentioning that Maiden of Black Water was initially a Wii U exclusive due to being funded by Nintendo, though they've seemingly allowed Koei Tecmo to publish it elsewhere. I mention this because according to an interview, it was actually Nintendo that suggested to Tecmo that they add a dead or alive character to the game, to put them in a situation where they wouldn't be able to fight their way out through normal means. I have to say, that's actually a pretty dope idea. An example of the creativity that can stem from putting fighting game characters in games outside of the genre. Ayane isn't the only dead or alive character to show up in crossovers though. Series post girl Kasumi also appears in the Ninja Gaiden games, albeit much less frequently. She appears in the final cutscene of Ninja Gaiden 2, though you don't see her face. She becomes playable in the series in Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge, sporting a new design specifically for this series though you can use some of her dead or alive outfits as well. She's also the only character in the game that actually has different hair designs that can be toggled interestingly enough. She's also a playable character in Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate as well as Warriors All-Stars. Quick aside, but there's one other fighting game character that shows up in Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate, Sophidia from Soul Calibur. She appears to be sucked into this game sometime after the events of Soul Calibur 4, which her design is also based on. She even gets her critical finish from Soul Calibur 4 and Broken Destiny as her special move in this game. I got you. Forgive me. This is the only, this is the only way. Before we move on to the last company I'll cover, I actually want to highlight the Warriors games themselves. Warriors Orochi is a crossover between Samurai Warriors and Dynasty Warriors first and foremost, but one thing you might not know is that the first Dynasty Warriors game was actually a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighter in the vein of Soul Edge. Granted, the characters in this series are all based on historical figures, so I'm not sure I should count the Musou Warrior game for this video, but I do think it was worth mentioning. Samurai Showdown RPG was, until recently, one of the most interesting fighting game spin-offs no one outside of Japan had played. This is basically what the title sounds like, a turn-based RPG taking place in the world of Samurai Showdown. You can select your starting character, and while they have their own plotline, you do meet up with the others later on. You get the ability to choose between playing retellings of Samurai Showdown 1 or 2 with each character. While it's mostly a fairly standard turn-based RPG, a few fighting game mechanics from the series manifest in pretty interesting ways here. For one, the rage mechanic the series is known for is present, with the meter filling as your attack, and your attack power rising as a result. The game also allows you to choose between standard menu confirmation for special attacks, or the ability to use fighting game inputs for special moves, with the inputs being more or less identical to how they're presented in the mainline fighters. It's a pretty neat way of keeping the player engaged, and I'm glad you get the option to switch in case you get bored with one of the modes. This is the kind of experiment I'd say I almost wish I could see from other fighting game series. A Street Fighter or Soul Calibur RPG would be pretty sick. 
Late last year, a fan translation for the game was finally completed for the Neo Geo CD version of the game, allowing for audiences outside of Japan to finally play the game for the first time. If you're even remotely interested in RPGs and fighting games, I definitely recommend giving this a try. There's an even more niche game to talk about next, and it actually stars another character from this game. Nagaruru Anohito Kata no Okurimono, translated as The Gift She Gave Me, is probably the single most interesting genre jump of any game in this video. This is a visual novel played from the point of view of a 7 year old orphan appointed to serve as the living assistant to the village shrine maiden, Nagaruru. This was a very late Japan only Dreamcast release that, similarly to Samurai Shodan RPG, got a stellar fan translation in the latter half of 2023. I admittedly haven't gotten too far in the game, but there is a little variety. In addition to having some branching conversations, there's also mini games to take part in like being quizzed on various foods. I'm still early on, so I don't quite know where the story is going yet, but the game does make a point to show the player that even removed from the harsh battles Nakaruru faces on the regular in the Samurai Showdown series, she's still seemingly plagued by nightmares of the violence she partakes in. There's little nods to Samurai Showdown here and there, but this is 100% standalone and requires zero knowledge of Nakaruru's home series to enjoy. It's certainly gotten my attention, and anyone with the means to play this should definitely check it out if you want a more unique look into this particular universe. But what if you want a more action-oriented SNK example? Metal Slug is probably SNK's most famous non-fighting game series. When the Arose buyout happened, and then the subsequent Playmore years, Metal Slug was one of the few series still trucking along in spite of things. The series notably got an exclusive entry on the Game Boy Advance, followed by a mainline sequel, Metal Slug 7 on Nintendo DS soon after. Not too long after that, SNK ported the game to the PlayStation Portable, adding new screen options, hidden routes, and updated audio. The game also added a new character via paid DLC. Leona from The King of Fighters. Leona wasn't very expensive. If I'm recalling correctly, she was only a dollar or so, but SNK must have felt like they needed to make her worth it if you had to pay for her, because she's easily the most overpowered character in the game. For one, Leona can keep any obtained weapon she's carrying when she dies. She loses them upon using a continue, but up to that point, she's safe. She also gets one extra hit point when in Metal Slugs with them needing 4 hits to be destroyed if using one with her instead of the normal 3. Most notably though, Leona can perform her trademark Moon Slasher move from the King of Fighters by holding up, L, and the fire button. Not only does this do a lot of damage, but she can use this defensively as well, since it'll destroy any projectiles it comes in contact with. You might be thinking that there's no way she can get any more absurd than that, but there's some neat tech you can do with Moon Slasher. Leona can cancel the Moon Slasher animation by pressing the button for grenades. However, Leona can cancel that animation into Moon Slasher as well, so by holding the button combo for Moon Slasher and alternating between the standard fire and grenade buttons, she can repeatedly chain Moon Slashers together, which decimates a lot of things in the game. Before we wrap up, I want to hit a few quick rapid fire honorable mentions. The final DLC expansion for Neo 2 features Neo Tengu from Dead or Alive as a boss fight. Alpine Racer 2 in the arcade has Kuma from Tekken as a secret character. He even uses tree branches for skis. Morrigan appears as a playable character in the Dreamcast port of Gunbird 2. Namco Smash Core Tennis series has had quite a few Namco crossover characters, ranging from the Tekken 3 incarnations of Eddie, Heihachi, and Yoshimitsu in one of the PS1 entries, to Heihachi, Xiaoyu, Raphael, and Cassandra in the PS2 sequel. So if you ever wanted to see Serena Williams whip Heihachi's ass in tennis, this is your game. The free-to-play basketball game Freestyle 2, hilariously enough, has Haomaru and Nakaruru as playable characters. I'm just gonna let this footage speak for itself. Virtual Quest is a pretty weird game. It's an action adventure game where you play as a kid that gets a device that lets him learn the abilities and fighting styles of the Virtua Fighter cast. 
Gaia Windquilt has a great video on this game that goes into way more detail that I'd highly recommend watching. That's going to wrap things up for this video. There's definitely games that I'm either forgetting or games I wanted to talk about but didn't have the means to adequately record, like Soul Calibur Legends. But if there's any I didn't touch on, I'd like to hear about them from you all. This is a subject that honestly fascinates me, and having more games of this ilk on my radar would definitely be neat. All that said, I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed putting it together. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.